Hello everyone, here we are. Now, as promised, I did look into the scripture about the shrewd manager and about Jesus's comments um, about the whole situation. Now, the parable is interesting because in most of his parables, somebody in the parable will represent a good person or Jesus or the Lord you know, like the master of the vineyard, etc., the son of the master of the vineyard. In this parable, it's different because they are not, neither the master nor the shrewd servant are particularly savory characters, okay? So Jesus tells the story, and he says, you know, this guy was shrewd. He was making sure he had a home to go to once he lost his job, okay? by sort of uh, foxing the the master out of some money but the master saw him do it and called him shrewd and said wow you know all right so then he goes on to say that the sons of light meaning us that we're not quite so shrewd and he talks about money and worldly wealth and I was sort of right. I was a little bit right when I said, I think it's about, I don't know, I think I mentioned something about maybe he's talking about using money to build the kingdom of God. Well, that is exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about winning souls to the kingdom so that they will welcome you to your eternal home. In other words, making friends with worldly wealth, meaning putting your money into missions, you know, supporting a, a mission group or tithing or offering or finding something like an orphanage in Uganda, like I have, and, 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 and a, another pastor who travels, walks the mountains of India, going to the absolutely furthermost tribes in India and preaches the gospel to them. Find things like that that you can put aside part of your money and support. And that's what Jesus is saying is, be a little more shrewd, you know, with your resources. If you've got worldly wealth, excuse me, not meaning wealthy, just whatever you have, okay? Take part of it and build the kingdom. And that way, the friends you make along the way will welcome you to your eternal home. So that's what that meant, okay? So um, let's get going with Luke 17, okay? Here we go. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It'd be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. Okay, now, like I say, some people like to apply this to pedophilia. Of course, little ones mean little kids, but in this instance, little ones mean all of us that believe in Jesus, okay? That's what little ones is referring to here. And then he goes on to say, so watch yourselves. He's not saying, don't be a pedophile. He's saying, watch yourselves that your behavior doesn't cause your brother or sister to fall down, okay? And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about if someone's behavior has made you act weird, okay? All right, so that's what that means. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. If your brother, excuse me, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Hmm, that can be a hard lesson, right? Because often we want, you know, honor and glory. If you're just doing what you were hired to do, you know, like the master's not going to ha say, come on in from your hard work and sit down and I'll serve you. He's going to say, no, come in and finish doing what I hired you for, which is to feed me. 
okay? I'm going to read that one more time just so I can get it. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, you should say, we're unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. Okay. In other words, you know, be happy with getting your pay, you know, doing your duty, getting your pay, etc. Now, on here, or I think more, it's a call to do your job well, okay? Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests and priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. So he wasn't even a Jew. He was an outsider. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Boy, there's a lesson, right? Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you'll long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Sad. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who's on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Remember, she turned around and looked back and turned into a big tilt pillar of salt. She was warned. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Hmm. You know what? Let's look that up really quick. That's the end of Luke 17. So let's look up Luke 17, Enduring Word. And let's see what he means by that. All right, here we go. Let's get all the way down here, the coming kingdom. One will be taken and the other left. Because, this is Pastor Guzik speaking, because this will happen during the normal course of life while one sleeps in bed, while another's grinding grain and another works in the field, the emphasis is on readiness. Jesus will come suddenly and at an unexpected moment. Two men in one bed, two women will be grinding, grinding together. These words of Jesus may indicate that it will be day in one part of the world while it's night in another. That makes sense, and I've never thought of that. 
At the same time, some sleep, others work in a field. Jesus will come for his people all over the earth at one moment. All right, so let's be ready, okay? Luke 18. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Let's brush up our faith, okay? Shine it up, polish it, put it out there. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. I love this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And that's, once again, the same as don't sit in the first highest seat at the dinner table, okay? Don't, because you might be asked to move down so someone more important can sit there, or that the master of the banquet favors. Take the low seat, okay? Don't go before the Lord and say, thank you that I don't sin this way, that way, or the other. Go to him and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because you know what? We're all sinners, okay? And you know that, and I know that. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me. And don't hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. We need to get rid of our hearts of stone, give our hearts of stone to the Lord, and let him give us a heart of flesh, brand new, like when you were a child. Just brand new. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. In essence, he's saying only God is good and I'm God. And yes, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? It's weird there. I'm going to read it again. Why uh, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one's good except God alone. He might have been trying to suss out where, you know, if this guy believed he was God, who knows? You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Now, false testimony we know means lies. You shall not lie. Liars are promised hell, okay? All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. That would call for a lot of trust, wouldn't it? Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
I guess because they can't imagine what it is to not be rich. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we've left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Now, I'm kind of wondering, you know, when I read this, I think to myself, well, I've left my family behind, but I'm not out there on the road doing street ministry. I don't know. I'm I'm kind of, you know how I say how scripture never loses its meaning, but it can minister to a lot of different situations. I'm going to claim this scripture and say that I have left my family. I could still be hanging on over there and trying to get along and going through all their drama but I just can't because it takes time away from Jesus Christ and the peace that I enjoy in him. All right. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that's written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He'll be delivered over to the Gentiles, meaning the Romans. They'll mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They'll flog him beat him, and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples didn't understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, how could you imagine it? As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what, what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is... Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to, the, to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And we're all lost, aren't we? While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas, M-I-N-A-S. It's a type of, it's a, a denomination of money. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. Called 10 of his servants, gave them 10 minas, put this money, okay. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. 
Then he sent for the servants to whom he'd given the money in order to find out what they'd gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your minna has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your minna has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your minna. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you didn't put in and reap what you didn't sow. Well, they didn't want him to be king and they hated him. So this guy is like responding to him in fear and in that kind of um, uh, not being of service. Uh, what would you call it? Insubordinate. He's, he's, refer he's uh, coming to him in having been insubordinate. His master replied, I'll judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man taking out what I didn't put in and reaping what I didn't sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his minnow away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minnows. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. So, you know, that reminds me of that scripture we were reading where, you know, it was sort of encouraging us, you know, the man who had 10,000 soldiers coming, trying to make war against the man, the other king who had 20,000 soldiers. And we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, you would not pick a fight like that. You would go and send a delegation out to garner peace between you, okay? And then Jesus said something about, you know, that indicated to me, and I mentioned it, that, you know, if we just have a little, give it up, give it up. You know, in other words, don't hang on to this little worthless thing that won't win the war, okay? And it just reminds me of that. He's saying here, you know, it, 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 take even the little he has is going to be taken. So better to give it up. You know, and now this servant should have uh, done what he said. He should have at least put it in the bank so he could have gotten some interest because he was absolutely disobedient. The man said before he left, here's some money. Make good use of it while I'm gone. All right. Um... But those enemies of mine who didn't want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Oh, you know what? I want to look this up, but let's finish this. Let's finish this, and then we're going to go back and look at it. Actually, we're going to look it up right now. Um, enduring Word, Luke 19. All right, I just want to see what he's going to, what Pastor Guzik is going to say about this situation. All right. Here we go. The parable of the stewards. Uh, because they thought the kingdom of God would appear. Okay. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. The parable is different than the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Here, 10 servants were each given an equal amount of money worth about three months of wages for a working man. I thought they were given 10, 5, and 1. Oh, well. God distributes some gifts differently according to his own pleasure. Others are universally given to every believer, such as the gospel, which is given to each Christian in equal measure. Delivered to them 10 minas. It isn't that each servant received 10 minas, but that 10 were distributed to the group as a whole. One to each of the 10 servants. Okay, this is different. Uh, do business till I come, he said. And then it says, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we'll not have this man to reign over us. It says, these were the citizens of the nobleman who lived in the area he ruled. These were not the servants who received the minas. The, these citizens hated him and they made it clear to the nobleman in Jesus' parable the nobleman did nothing to deserve this rejection. It was only because the citizens had hearts full of hate. Wow, we can think about that as like when Trump was here. He had, didn't do anything. He did right by us. And yet he was so hated. 
as if none of us have sin, right? Um, all right, so he received the kingdom. He then commanded the servants to whom he'd given the money to be called to him. The first came saying, Master, your minna has earned... Oh, okay, I was, I'm not remembering it correctly. They did get one minna each. And he says, Master, your minna has earned 10 minas. And he brought a good report. He did business and he had 10 more to show for it. That's an impressive 1,000% increase. All right. Master, your minna has earned five, and then that guy got five cities to rule over. All right, then another came and said, "I here's your minna back. All right. Um, and he says, out of your own mouth, I'll judge you. You knew that I was an austere man. The master did not reward the third servant. Instead, he rebuked him because the great power of the master should have inspired the servant to greater diligence, not to disobedience and laziness. Okay, so it wasn't the servants that were hating him. Because uh, I think I said something like, well, they hated him. and or I don't know. I don't know what I said. Um, but it wasn't the servants that were hating him. But this servant was insubordinate, which is what I said. Okay. So then he says, for I say to you, to everyone that who has will be given and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. It says the paradoxical, almost oxymoronic statement reflects the spiritual axiom earlier recorded in Luke 8.18. Whoever is faithful to the Lord will be rewarded and whoever is not will suffer loss. Light received brings more light. Light refused brings the night. And that was by someone named Pate, P-A-T-E, last name. All right. In the Christian life, we do not stand still. We use our gifts and make progress or we lose what we have. Okay, that's the crux of the whole matter. All right, then I'm going to go very quickly here to, but bring here those enemies of mine who didn't want me to reign over them and slay them before me. The servants all had to answer for their work in the master's absence, but at least none of them were guilty of treason. Man, this is appropriate to America. Now the master dealt with his enemies. We're, we're lucky that if Trump gets back in, that he's not going to turn around and slay all these people who've hated him, right? This is America. We don't do stuff like that. Uh, now the master dealt with his enemies, the rebellious citizens mentioned in Luke 19, 14, who hated him and said, we will not have this man to reign over us. So if this doesn't show you that the more things change, the more they stay exactly the same. There's nothing we're going through that, that hasn't been spoken of or shown earlier in history because Jesus is giving an example of this right here. And uh, they could, it says they could try and deny the reign of the master as much as they pleased, but it would get them nowhere. He would rule over them one way or another. The servants of the master each had to answer to him, but so did his enemies. They met with certain final judgment. This dramatic and strong ending shows that responding to the reign of Jesus is a life or death decision. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, that's an incredible revelation right there. So this master is going to rule over everybody no matter what, okay? Jesus is Lord. Every tongue is going to confess that. In the end, his enemies will be thrown into outer darkness. So he's going to rule and reign no matter whether they like him or not. This is clearly far beyond Trump, but parts of this have to do with someone who was in the leadership position, who was elected and put there, who had many enemies that hated him without a cause. Okay? Now, thankfully, he, he doesn't have that right to start slaying people that don't like him. This is America. But when it comes to Jesus Christ and God the Father, they will have that right. Oof. Oof. That is so intense. Please take that into your heart, okay? You're, you're, the, the Lord is your master whether you like it or not. Whether be, Not because, I'm not saying that in a slavery way. I'm saying that in the way that whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, no matter what, Jesus is still Lord and he's saying it right here. 
he's still Lord. And there is that scripture that says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you're going to hear your own tongue doing that, whether you like it or not. Oh, God, it is a life and death decision, people. Please, if you are hearing my voice, please come to Jesus now. Surrender to the power of the universe. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and Excuse me, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told him. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought the, it to Jesus threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. He might be talking about the end, Armageddon, end time talk. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It's written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. I love you very much. Uh, please forgive um, whatever mistakes that I make. Be gracious to me. I'm doing uh, my very best. I'm hoping that you're following the revelations that I'm getting right along with me. I hope you're following. I love you. Pray for me. I'm praying for you, and I will see you tomorrow. And we'll pick it up with Luke 20. Love you. Good night.